Baxter. I am the Director of Business Development with AccuPlan Benefit Services. Today's topic we'll be covering using the self-directed IRA for private lending. Many of our clients have actually expressed interest in this, uh, ask, uh, this class of, uh, of an investment class uh, because once again a lot of people want to take advantage of investing in real estate but may not either have the time and or the, ex the background or expertise to invest in real estate. So what better way to actually invest in real estate in terms of becoming the bank? Um, basically what this allows you to do is use your, IRA, your retirement funds in the form of an IRA or 401k, transfer a roll over those funds into a self-directed IRA or 401k, and make alternative investments. One of the options you have when it comes to an alternative invest, the alternative investment class is actually becoming the bank and becoming a private lender. So what we're going to be talking about once again is in terms of the basics on the self-directed IRA, but we're going to spend most of our time talking about how to actually set up a situation to where you're actually able to loan money using your self-directed IRA. And for those who are looking to obtain capital for, say, for example, buying and flipping and buying holding property, this is also, there's also information in this presentation that will basically let you know what your role would be and how you would actually go about approaching those with self-directed funds to become a source of capital for some of your projects. Uh, the information we're going to be covering today is uh, primarily for education. Uh, our objective is not to steer you towards any type of investment, uh, give you any form of tax or legal advice. Once again, our objective is to empower you with education and information to make a sound, uh, sound investment choices and decisions. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and read off our disclaimer. Uh, actually, just uh, make emphasis um, in terms of our disclaimer. Uh, if you're looking uh, to move forward with a self-directed account, it's really important to understand that the objective here is, once again, we're giving you education. What you really need to do is have uh, both the education as well as some of your team in place as it relates to helping you along the way to move forward with any transaction relative to using a self-directed account. Um, let's go ahead and move over to the next slide here. So once again, private lending in your IRA is a topic. Allow your IRA to become the bank. So um, I just went over a disclaimer. Once again, it's really important that you consult with your attorneys, tax professionals, and legal professionals and when it comes to performing your due diligence on any type of investment. And that includes whether you should be lending money out of your retirement account and doing the due diligence required and to determine whether and who you should actually be lending your funds to. These are the different types of plans that most people are using to self-direct. Uh, and some of the plans may look familiar to you. And that, in, ex in, in essence, the plans that we offer in terms of self-direction are usually the same plan types that you may find as some of your traditional custodians, such as a Charles Schwab, Franklin Templeton, and E-Trade, and so on and so forth. The difference is our plan agreement allows us to allow you to make alternative investments. So the most common question is, well, how come I've never heard of a self-directed IRA? Um, Actually, the question should be is, uh, why aren't you able to make these same investments in some of your current custodial accounts? And as I mentioned, that the reason that's not allowed is based on their plan agreement type and the limitations and the structures within that agreement does not allow them to basically allow you to hold certain assets beyond some of your traditional investments such as stocks, bonds, annuities, CDs, so on and so forth. Um, our plan basically allows you to invest in everything with the exception of life insurance and collectibles. And that also includes if you want to continue to make traditional investments in the stock market or other, in other traditional investments, you basically have the best of both worlds using a self-directed retirement account. So let's start with the first type of account, the more, the more popular, more tra traditional account is the traditional IRA. That is the individual retirement account that basically is available to anyone who's employed or self-employed provided that they have earned income to make the contributions. Now if you have a situation to where you're unemployed or you're not receiving any form of income, and you have these type of retirement accounts and have funds in it, or you've actually transferred or rolled over funds from a previous retirement account from an employer, you're actually in a position to be able to move those funds into one of our self-directed plans in order to mark, start making alternative investments. The contribution limit on a traditional IRA is up to $5,000 provided you have earned income, and the monies actually in that type of account will be growing tax deferred, which means that any growth realized, you don't start paying taxes until you pull funds out of the account in which you will be taxed at ordinary income, whatever your tax rate may be based on your income structure. 
Uh, the Roth IRA also can be self-directed. The difference between the Roth IRA and the traditional IRA is, as I mentioned, the traditional IRA, your growth, uh, any funds that, uh, profits that you realize in that account grow tax deferred. With the Roth IRA, as long as you've met two milestones that you're at the age of 50 and above and that you have to account for at least five years, any growth that you realize in that account after you've met those two milestones, you pay no federal income taxes. So a lot of our clients, as you can imagine, are looking forward to or taking advantage of transferring or rolling or converting funds from their tax deferred account, whether it be an IRA, a traditional IRA, a SEP IRA, and any of the other plans that I'm showing here on the screen, including a 401k into a Roth component. And because of what's going to be uh, anticipated to happen as of January 1st in terms of the, what's going on with the fiscal cliff problem as well as the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, everyone is going to be subject to some form of tax increases. So depending on what uh, category you fall into, uh, you could be subject to higher income tax. So you definitely want to maybe consider sitting down with your tax professional and figuring out is a Roth account for you. And if so, you may want to take a look at maybe some of the funds that you have in some of these tax deferred accounts and maybe start looking to convert all or a portion of those funds over to a Roth IRA. As I mentioned, the contribution limits are the same as the traditional IRA. The contribution limit is $5,000 if you're under 50, $6,000 if you're over 50. Uh, you also have what's called a SEP IRA, which is the, uh, the simple employer plan. And this plan is a tax deferred account. It's designed for those who are self-employed or 1099. The contribution limit on this type of plan, you can contribute up to $50,000 or 25% of your modified adjusted gross income. So it's really important that you not exceed to $50,000, so you definitely want to sit down with your tax professional and figure out, based on what uh, you have calculated for as income for that tax year, what is your modified adjusted gross income, and you can contribute 25%, up to 25% of that modified adjusted gross income, up to $50,000, into a SEP IRA, which also can be self-directed. The simple IRA is for those small and medium-sized businesses that have less than 100 employees who are also looking to take advantage of self-direction pretty much set up the same structure as a 401k, but it's less complicated and less labor intensive in terms of maintaining as a 401k. And uh, once again, as long as you have under 100 employees, uh, you can offer this plan uh, for both yourself as well as your spouse and also to your employees in which the contribution limit is 11500 if you're under 50 and it's a $2,500 catch up if you're over the age of 50. Uh, the 1k is, which is a popular plan for those who are self-employed and or 1099. Uh, it's kind of a hybrid between a 401k and a SEP IRA. This plan allows you to contribute up to $50,000, but you have two buckets. Uh, you can contribute up to $17,000 as an employee, equivalent if you were employed at any other employer, uh, you can contribute up to $17,000 per year. And then the other bucket is pretty much your SEP bucket, where you can contribute the balance up to $50,000 or 25% of your modified adjusted gross income up to the remaining of the $50,000. Some elect to go with the Roth component um, in terms of the other, uh, as an alternative bucket to say, for example, the 401k bucket, uh, which is tax deferred, they can actually contribute uh, monies into that Roth bucket. And of course, as we mentioned in the previous, uh, about the previous Roth, is that any growth that you realize in any Roth account grows tax-free after you have the account for five years and 59 and a half. So it's definitely something that the, you know you may want to take a look at as it relates to um, kind of sh uh, sheltering yourself from some of these looming tax increases that's looking to come down the pipe in 2013. So what are the benefits of self-direction? Uh, of course, uh, one of the models of, in the self-directed IRA industry is that uh, you invest in, know, invest in what you know and understand. So for those who, I like to believe that everyone in the public basically have some type of talent or gift in terms of having some knowledge in a specific area to where maybe they can benefit by growing their retirement account in that specific area. So it basically gives you the ability to take control of your retirement account opposed to putting your trust and your money in the hands of a third party. Um, a lot of times it's going to get paid whether you, uh, whether you make money or lose money and that's some of your traditional investments. This basically gives you the ability to look outside of what's offered in Wall Street and basically be able to grow some of your uh, grow your retirement account at less risk and less volatility to some of, what's going, some of the problems that's going on in Wall Street and as well as globally. 
Uh, you, of course, have to take on the responsibility of performing your own due diligence. And even with some of your traditional investments, you still have a certain level of responsibility of performing due diligence. But with a self-directed IRA, you take on an added responsibility of performing due diligence because, once again, there is no one taking on the fiduciary responsibility within this type of plan structure to where they're going to be vetting any type of investments that you're considering. So it's really important that you do get your education, do your uh, due diligence, check out the investment, and if necessary, until you're ready, gain the necessary education to move forward, hold off for right now, or be, maybe partner with someone with, with the expertise using your capital to move forward to grow your retirement account. And we'll talk more about uh, partnering and uh, some future slides moving forward. Uh, the objective here is to minimize your risk and maximize your returns by truly invest, uh, diversifying your retirement account. So you may hear the term, some of your planners and advisors, that you're diversified. You've, we've given you 15 options, but of course, their de definition of diversification is maybe the 15 options that they offer you. But true diversification would be options that they offer you and options that's outside of the stock market. So once again, as I mentioned, with this truly self-directed IRA, you have the, uh, the access to both traditional and non-traditional investments. Your only limitations and or restrictions would be that you cannot invest in life insurance and collectibles. Those are your only restrictions. Other than that, the sky is the limit. Invest in knowing what you understand. That's once again the model that we take on. Once again, there's a huge benefit to basically being able to use a self-directed IRA and grow your, uh, your account either tax-free or tax-deferred with relatively low risk relative to the type of investments that you're looking at. But once again, you have to do your due diligence on that investment. You have a wide variety of options that you have to choose from. As I just mentioned, the only restrictions you have is life insurance and collectibles. Outside of those two areas in terms of investments, I, the sky is the limit. So here's just some of the investments that are more common that I'm sure if you were to contact your planner or advisor that these would be considered restricted investments, or at least that not investments that their plan agreement would allow you to take advantage of using your retirement account under their um, umbrella, so to speak. So I'm sure looking at this here, hopefully your wheels are turning and kind of looking, thinking outside of the box in terms of some of the options that you really have available to you to go out and really grow your retirement account safely. So keep in mind, there are rules relative to using this type of account. Uh, as with any uh, account, there are certain rules that must be followed. And it's really important that you understand the rules in terms of making sure that you follow the rules to prevent any disqualification of your account, which usually results in both taxation as well as uh, penalties assessed against your account. These penalties can be pretty stiff. So just to give you an idea, uh, if the, the account is disqualified for what's called a prohibited transaction, uh, your account can, will be taxed at the full amount of what's in that account in addition to a 10% early distribution penalty. So you're going to pay whatever your tax rate is at ordinary income plus a 10% early distribution penalty. So you can see where the penalty can be pretty stiff if you're not basically following the rules of this type of retirement account and basically staying uh, within structure to make sure that you're not violating any rules. The IRA owner may not loan money uh, on an investment held by the IRA, um, held by the investment uh, by the IRA. Instead, a third party must service the loan. So for example, if you're looking to loan money, as we're going to be discussing here, um, there must be a third party. In this case, the third party is going to be us as the third party administrator to facilitate the transaction on the behalf of the IRA. We're going to be working with the title company in terms of making sure the funds are dispersed per your written request when the time is right in terms of getting those funds over the title and escrow to close the transaction out. Instead, a third party must service the loan. So, for example, if you uh, have the idea, say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and loan these monies out. Can I actually service my loan? As like with any other asset um, within this structure, it must be a third party performing any type of uh, um, responsibility that may be deemed a sweat equity or enhancing um, the profit or the uh, position of the retirement account. Uh, you cannot actually uh, service the loan, collect the monthly payment zone, and so forth you're definitely going to have to hire someone to, to, uh, to uh, perform this um, responsibility for you. Now, are you prohibited from actually just having the funds come directly to you and then you, for your record uh, purposes, making copies of the checks and then forwarding them along to us? Uh, that's something that can be done. Make sure that the check is, of course, made payable to the retirement account, and we'll talk about how that check should be made out in terms of the vesting. But that is something that can be done. But anything outside of collecting the monthly payments just for record-keeping purposes, has to be delegated to a third party 
outside of the IRA and yourself. The IRA owner may not receive any current benefit from the investment in the IRA. So as we mentioned to those who are looking to buy real estate, you cannot live in the property or basically uh, receive any immediate benefit from the assets held within the IRA. So if you're loaning money, you cannot receive monies to coming back to you in the form of additional compensation to live on. Those funds must go back into the IRA. Now, if you have in a situation to where you're retired and you want to start taking what's called distributions, those funds, of course, must go back to the IRA, and then you request through the custodian us to cut you a check for whatever the desired amount is, and at the end of the year, we'll accumulate the total of the distributions that you have taken, and we'll generate a 1099 for that amount in which you will basically be filing with your personal income tax and pay the taxes on that amount that you have taken to live on throughout the year. The IRA is a trust. It is a separate entity outside of yourself, as when you pay your taxes, your tax ID number is your Social Security number, uh, your actual self-directed IRA has its own separate tax ID number, ensuring that it is an arm's length transaction between both yourself and that retirement account to make sure that it is actually its own separate entity. Assets in the IRA must be vested in the name of the custodian or the, uh, the nominee for the benefit of the IRA. So in this case here, as I mentioned earlier, when that check is cut, everything, whether it be contract, checks must be cut to the vesting of the IRA. So below here is an example of what investing would look like for an IRA, whether it be the vesting of the property, uh, contracts, invoices, whatnot, that must reflect that vesting on the contract. Check anything relative to the asset within that IRA. The benefits of working with other people's money. So we're going to talk about um, how to actually go out and identify um, those who are looking for money, identify those uh, who may be one of partners. So these are some of the uh, variables that really come into play when it comes to private lending with a self-directed IRA. It's easier to buy mortgage or make private loans using IRA funds uh, than to purchase real estate. The perception is that there is less to worry about uh, with paper than hard assets that needs to be uh, maintained. So what that means is that for those who are not looking to actively engage in investing in real estate, whether it be buy and hold and buy and flip, uh, one of the options definitely available uh, for those who are looking to take a, a passive approach in real estate investing is to become the private bank or the private lender. Uh, you can actually set up fractional interest to achieve lending or acquisition requirement. Um, in addition, work with the multiple uh, investors. Each receives a fractional interest or share of the underlying security note. So what that means is that uh, you can actually partner and basically create uh, different fractional interests in a one promissory note so if you have a situation to where you see a project and you want to go out and um, you don't have enough money in your retirement account, you can bring together several retirement accounts in addition to private funds to partner up to be able to loan money um, on that project. Uh, you may have someone who's at a real estate investment club who has, say, a $500,000 uh, investment that they're looking to rehab and turn over. Um, the numbers work, but of course you don't have enough money. So what you may want to do is maybe between yourself spouse, friends, and relative is uh, to set up a, uh, an agreement to where there's a fractional interest. One note, of course, but each party within that note has a fractional interest within that note, usually determined by what each party contributes towards um, funds that's going to be lent out on the project. But you definitely have options. Okay, with the self-directed IRA, the IRA uh, selects the investment as the ultimate decision maker. The IRA must perform his or her own uh, due diligence. So when it comes to private lending, you're basically going to have to basically put on the cap or the hat of becoming an under, a loan underwriter. Uh, the criteria is going to vary from each party, from each person to person, depending on what gives you the comfort level to loan money out. I personally loan money out of my SEP IRA. I've been doing it since 2008. I have a mortgage background, of course, so this is something that comes pretty much second nature for me. But one of the things that I consider is I put more emphasis on the property, of course. If I have to break it up into percentages, I put 75% of my due diligence uh, geared more towards the looking at the property, making sure the loan value is where I need it to be, looking at the property in terms of potential downturns and the, uh, the, the value of the property, and of course, potential for uh, appreciation in the property, and I'll make my decision. And of course, I definitely want to make sure that whoever I'm loaning their money to in terms of an investor is that they have a background and the knowledge and the expertise in terms of performing um, the necessary uh, procedures to turn that property over. Because in most cases, as I mentioned, I loan money to those who are buying and flipping properties. 
and in most cases I'm looking for my monies to come back within six to nine months. Uh, my maximum loan to value is usually is between 65 70 percent. I usually will also incorporate an additional clause in the contract if I'm not so comfortable with uh, just say the 12 to 14 percent I'm going to be charging on the note and in the event that the uh, payment period goes beyond the repayment period goes beyond the six to nine months kind of act as a uh, incentive to make sure that they pay me back on time I'll actually put in a clause that basically require them to pay me a percentage of equity in addition to my 12 to 14 percent if it goes beyond the 12 to four, uh, the, the six to nine month period uh, the promissory note so you have some flexibility and uh, as it relates to putting your transactions together but you definitely once again wants to get educated uh, partner with those who may have education in this area and if necessary pay for someone to provide the services to uh, help you do your due diligence to make sure that your investment remains sound. No uh, requirement to, there's no requirement to record a document or get a uh, record a document or get the title insurance on the property but I strongly suggest that you do not take any shortcuts pay whatever the cost is to make sure that the uh, documents are recorded uh, with the title company and in this case if you're working with the title company they're going to charge you a fee to make sure these steps are taken are, are taken um, taken care of for you to make sure the documents are recorded and, and filed and that also uh, and it's optional for the title insurance but you want to make sure that you pay the additional amount for title insurance to ensure that you are in the position that you desire to be in as it relates to the deed of trust and promissory note it's nothing worse to assume that you're going to be in first position and you didn't pay for the title insurance to ensure that there's no other potential clouds looming that can cloud the title or, or affect your position in terms of position on the property uh, to make sure that in the event of default that uh, you're at less risk of loss than any other parties who are actually maybe on title. The IRA can state what it needs uh, to feel protected. So once again, as the lender, uh, you're going to be acting on behalf of the IRA in terms of what's best for your retirement account. So you can pretty much make it up as you go along in terms of what gives you the comfort level that you need to make the decisions alone in that property and what the terms are going to be. The IRA can make both secured and unsecured loans, although I'm strongly against unsecured loans, even with friends and relatives, it is allowed. Uh, the terms, once again, is pretty much what you make it. Uh, you want, do want to make sure that the terms are realistic, especially if it's unsecured, because you don't want a situation to where if the account is ever audited, that um, they want to know, meaning the IRS want to know why is it that you're basically loaning money at 3% and you're getting 1% to 3%. You might have been better off just leaving your monies where they are, especially if the market basically is, is, is bearing an interest rate of, say, 8 to 10%. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you can pretty much justify as to why you're charging such a low interest rate. And what they're looking for is when they see something like that, it usually poses a red flag if there's some form of self-dealing because no one is actually going to be loaning out money at 3% when they can get 8 10% or higher uh, based on what the market bears. So maybe definitely want to keep that in mind. The comfort level of the IRA investor. So if you're looking to borrow money from an IRA investor, it's really important that you make that party feel as comfortable as possible answer any and all questions they may have, and really just be as transparent as possible about yourself, your organization, and the property at hand that you're looking for the capital on. Uh, do not assume that because there are people you know uh, that they are comfortable in doing business with you. Expect to be prepared for some of these friends and relatives to basically grill you a little, a little harder, if not a lot harder, than a total stranger. Keep in mind, if you're asking for their money, uh, this is their life savings, so they want to make sure that um, they get all the information and the questions answered before they relinquish those funds to you. Let me go to the next slide here. Okay, so once again, I'm um, waiting for the next slide to progress here. Uh, you want to make sure that you, once again, um, perform your due diligence on the property before you move forward and like I said it was more comfortable more important than ever is to once again is to make sure that when you're working if you're the actual lender you want to basically perform as much due diligence on the borrower and the, and the property itself and then if you're the borrower once again it's really important to make sure that you're as transparent as possible uh, making sure this other slide here moves forward Okay, 
know the user and the another aspect you want to make sure if you are going to be lending money you want to be familiar with the usury laws in the state in which you're going to be lending the money each state varies in terms of what the rules and the low the laws are when it comes to usury laws so you don't want to have a situation to where you're charging say 12 to 14 percent but that state basically only allows you to charge 10 percent so you definitely want to be prepared to make sure that you're aware of those laws because there's nothing worse than thinking that you're going to get a 12 to 14 percent return and that borrower only realizes that you can only charge them 10 percent and they challenge you on the terms of the note only restricting you to receive 10 percent um, of course the states you know this is once uh, one again uh, one of the things you want to perform your due diligence on is to make sure that if you're looking for the highest return possible is to make sure you're aware of what the usury laws in those states are. Maybe in one state they only allow 10 percent and the other state is 14, 15 percent. Maybe you want to avoid going to that state where it's 10 percent or doing business in that state. And there's other laws that could affect uh, you doing business in those states, but definitely you want to do your due diligence and find out what those rules are as it relates to private lending in those states. Know the lending laws in the states in which the loan is granted as well as the security laws. Uh, there's some securities laws that may come into play in certain states, uh, so you definitely want to know what they are. Structure a security interest that is marketable in case the IRA needs to sell the interest to raise cash. One of the oppositions you may run into in terms of considering this investment, especially in your in the process of moving funds from your existing or traditional custodian, is that this is probably not a good idea in the event that you need to liquidate into cash. What are you going to do? Well, for most for the most part. What I usually tell people is that in most cases, whether it's, uh, the monies are with us or with any other custodian, if you're under 59 and a half, you're restricted from accessing those funds until you're 59 and a half anyway. So in the event that you did need to access those funds for an emergency, uh, you can always, in the case of a security or a promissory note, as long as the note is seasoned for usually 12 months or more, you can always sell that note at a slight discount on the secondary market. So there is an extra strategy in the event of an emergency that you needed cash that you can actually raise cash if you needed it right away right away okay um, we're going to talk about some of the rules as it relates to what the rules would be as it relates to the borrower and the lender what those rules would be to, uh, how they would apply to each party within the transaction so for starters here the borrower and the lender it's important that the LTV is reasonable what does that mean the loan to value on the property is reasonable so you don't want a situation to where uh, you as the lender is being too conservative saying that you're only going to loan up to say 45 percent loan to value uh, that might be realistic if based if it's based on uh, before repair value and we'll talk about that but for the most part you want to be competitive if you're looking to go out and make this a secondary business and you want to have multiple sources to loan money to because keep in mind what a borrower is looking for is a loan to value that's reasonable and also competitive and of course you as a lender is making sure that that loan to value is not too high to where if there's a dip in the market that you're exposed because either you're right at a hundred percent loan to value or you're upside down so in most cases, what the norm is usually between 65 and 70 percent is the norm. Some have been known to go higher, but of course, if you go higher, you're usually going to charge more points and or a higher interest rate. But that's up to you as a lender in terms of what's comfortable for you to take on any additional risk. The higher the loan to value may go. As the borrower, it's important that you are as transparent as I mentioned earlier uh, before, as that you're as transparent and as forthcoming as possible to the lender giving a, a complete background on yourself, the investment, and the history of your business. Uh, you want to make sure that they, ha uh, as the borrower, that you have a plan. Explain to the lender in terms of in the event of an ex uh, that you have to, uh, what the, how the funds are going to be used. Is it going to be used for both acquisition and rehab? In most cases, a lot of times the lender is not too concerned about that. And then their main objective is to really know, get an understanding that you are an expert in your field and that if the term of the notice says, six to nine months or 12 months that there's not going to be anything as it relates to your expertise or, or background that's going to prohibit them from getting their return uh, as well as their initial investment back out at the term of this transaction. So you want to make sure that you're as transparent and show them as much detailed information and background information on yourself as well as your business as well as the project as, as, as a whole. The borrower also has a responsibility, of, if necessary, or requested by the lender is to perform or offer a personal guarantee. A lot of times beyond the property, uh, the lender may want that. It may be a situation to where their property is in a kind of a challenging area. They want to do the deal, but at the same time, they want to make sure that 
they are completely protected in the event the worst happens. So be prepared to, as the borrower, to, if necessary, to be able to offer a personal guarantee. And that can come in the form of personal assets, other uh, properties that you may have, a vested interest in, whatever it takes in order to be able to get that person in a, a position to where they're comfortable to where they want to loan those monies to you based on the terms that's going to be mutually agreed. Uh, the IRA owner uh, are especially concerned about having an exit strategy and protecting their IRA and their investments. So it's important that you go into detail in the event of the worst case scenario, what are you going to do? So for example, is there enough equity or um, profit in this deal to where if you have to sell this property because you were looking to buy and flip at the mark, uh, buy and flip the property, and the market kind of took a hit. Is there enough equity in the property or the in the uh, profits in the property to where you can sell it of necessary wholesale? You may not make anything of the borrower, but the objective is to make sure you do not tarnish that relationship with the lender to where they can actually say, okay, well things didn't work out, but I didn't lose my principal. They may not have made a return, but they didn't lose their principal, and that's what's really key. I mean, there's certain things that's going to happen in any investment that's out of your control, but the main objective, if you're borrowing someone else's money, you do not want them to lose their principal. Borrowing as an LLC, uh, there's some pros and cons to uh, going with that structure, so we'll go over this real briefly in terms of what to consider if you're going to be going with an LLC structure. Uh, an LLC structure can be detrimental to an IRA. Um, one of the uh, detriments could be might not allow change in ownership that easily. Um, so it's something that you want to de uh, definitely consider. Um, look at your both your short -term, your short term and long term objective for any assets held within that LLC. For an IRA to be cash, uh, it may also may be harder for an IRA to be cashed out because everything is being held within that LLC and may not be that easily uh, be dissolved. Uh, can violate uh, blue. Uh, uh, blue, uh, blue sky laws in certain states, so that's something you want to be aware of also if you're looking to set up an LLC. And blue, laws, uh, blue sky laws is a form of uh, SEC laws that are applicable in certain states, so you definitely, as uh, if you're a lender and you're looking to set up an LLC and do any form of lending, uh, you want to be aware of any uh, laws of that, such, of that type within the states that you're going to be conducting your business. Undivided interest could be uh, a, ch a task or a challenge, uh, so make sure, uh, make sure uh, your job and communicating with, uh, in advance with the IRA investor uh, more difficult. So basically what they're saying here, um, if you have a situation, with, if you have a self-directed IRA and an LLC, it could make your ability um, to communicate in advance with the IRA investor more difficult because the LLC uh, may not be able to liquidate uh, all that quickly. So once again, depending on the structure, the term of the loan, uh, how long the money is going to be out there in terms of liquidation, it could hinder uh, your ability to liquidate in that situation, but for the most part, from what I've seen, with the LLC, usually, um, and you don't have any way of determining uh, that uh, as the borrower, but um, with an LLC, usually it is usually ample cash, maybe from other deals coming in. Uh, there's really a, liquid, a liquidation problem as it relates to any asset, well, as it relates to any cash, but as it relates to assets, you may have a situation to where it may take a little bit longer because of that, of that added layer, meaning that LLC structure that it may take a little bit longer to liquidate the assets. So it's something that you may want to be concerned about as the uh, if you're setting up an LLC. But for the most part, um, based on my experience, direct as well as indirect, for the most part, there haven't been any uh, problems in this area. So it's, usually these problems arise in times uh, when things are a little tough in the market. There's a declining market. Property values are declining. But for the most part, when things are rising, you usually don't have any of these problems. So I'm going to go over a real quick uh, case study to kind of give you a real clear idea how this process and the structure works if you're looking to loan money or borrow money using a self-directed IRA. So in this case here, Lisa's IRA agrees to lend $100,000 to Pete. That um, property is going to be secured by a single-family house in Kansas. Um, the notes uh, secured by real estate, as we mentioned here, the whole objective is that this is going to be a secure transaction uh, secured by a piece of real estate. So in this case here, Lisa's IRA is the source of funds for Pete's purchase. Pete, in this case, I, I'm obviously going to be, I'm going to assume he's going to be a rehabber. So uh, Lisa's going to submit an investment and direction form, which is one of our internal forms, giving us written instruction and detailed instructions in terms of what she wants done relative to this transaction, which also includes the disbursement of funds, when they're dispersed to funds, and so on and so forth. Lisa directs AccuPlan to send the money on the behalf over to uh, Lisa's IRA. 
in which in turn when the time is uh, when Lisa instructs us either verbally or within that direction of investment, we're going to disperse those funds over to the title company. The note is made payable to American Estate and Trust, and if, uh, in most cases it's going to be a note accompanied by a deed of trust or mortgage. Um, that information is going to be sent to AccuPlan or American Estate and Trust. We're going to sign off as a third-party administrator on the behalf of Lisa's IRA. Those documents will then be sent back over to title for them to perform their process in terms of closing the transaction. In this case here, the security is a deed is endorsed over with an assignment clause uh, that is optional. And in most cases, if you do have a deed, you want to make sure that it can be assigned because what you want in the event that you need to sell this property, that you want an assignment clause. And a lot of times people make the mistake of setting up these transactions and maybe need to exit out of it to sell it, and it does not have an assignment clause. You cannot sell one of these instruments if it does not have an assignment clause. Payments are made uh, directly to Lisa's IRA. So as I mentioned earlier, you have a vesting. In this case here, it's going to be American Estate and Trust. Lisa's IRA for the benefit of Lisa is how that check should be made payable to, um, to Lisa's IRA each month to make the monthly payments for the note on this, on this uh, that was basically derived from her retirement account. If Pete defaults on the property, Lisa has the ability to fork, or Lisa or IRA has the ability to foreclose on the property. But keep in mind, Lisa has to make sure that she has enough money in the retirement account to cover the expenses to take care of any illegal costs associated with the foreclosing on the property. Lisa is prohibited from going into her pocket personally in the event her IRA does not have enough money in the account to take care of any foreclosure proceedings. Now, what does Lisa do if that is the case that she doesn't have enough money in her account because she just got started and she didn't assume that she would have to foreclose on this property within, say, the first six months? She assumed after maybe six to 12, nine months, she would have enough money in the event the worst was to happen, but that didn't make it that far. So what Lisa's going to have to consider is that does she have enough money, uh, money in her personal account to make a contribution up to the maximum that that plan would allow? So in this case here, she just say hypothetically she has a traditional or Roth IRA, her maximum contribution, because say she's under 50, is $5,000. So that's all she can contribute out of her pocket into that account in the form of a contribution. Uh, the other option she would have if she has other retirement accounts is to transfer rollover funds from that other retirement account into that plan and make up any uh, uh, shortages that she may be short in that account to take care of expenses for the foreclosure. And lastly, she has the option to go with what's called a non-recourse loan. There's a handful of um, non, what they call non-portfolio lend or portfolio lenders that will actually grant a loan to your IRA using a form of property. In this case here, your property, would, uh, the collateral for that loan would be the property where you're in first position. The lender would actually grant you a loan to a certain loan value to give you the cash that you need. And that's all another option. also another option if you have a bunch of properties, and especially if you have a situation if you have to foreclose on a property and you need cash right away, to maybe sell that property, you can always get a non-recourse loan and to get the cash that you need to bring the property up to speed in terms of rehab and whatnot to sell it. So you do have some options. Collateral sources. Um, so as you're, if you're a lender, these are some of the collateral sources you may want to consider out, outside of the subject property. Of course, if you're going to go with the subject, uh, the subject property is a given, so you want to make sure that you do not have a situation to where uh, you're giving a high LTV because that could put you at risk in the down market. Um, subject property via deed of trust, preferably in first position. And like I said, you want to make sure that you're insured in that first position by getting title insurance and getting a title search performed on that property. Make sure that there's no other encumbrances, um, encumbrances against the property that will basically risk you being in first position. Other real property as, as well as real, uh, other real property in the form of other real estate property is another option. In addition to maybe having a first deed of trust on the subject property, um, say they want additional money. You can also, if you're comfortable, that is, is to request cross uh, collateralization against another piece of property. A co-signer um, is an option also. You may not feel comfortable with just the property itself, the person, uh, personal credit or personal history in terms of um, giving you the added comfort you need to move forward on this transaction may be suspect, so you may require this person to to uh, get someone to co-sign. Make sure that co-signer has strong credit and in addition to strong credit, uh, maybe some liquidatable assets in the event that you have to sue that co-signer in the event of default. 
Um, so these are some of the options there that you want to explore in the event uh, that you're going to go this route and to make sure that you do not subject yourself to any losses because of certain things that may be out of the control of the borrower. A UCC1 is an option. This is where if um, it's a business, uh, you, of course, can basically uh, have a UCC1 as a form of collateral against that business and maybe some of the equipment or assets of that business. Accounts receivables, um, depending on, once again, if it's the borrower it owns a business, you can also basically use accounts receivables as a form of collateral. A little more sophisticated if you're not familiar with the term of factoring, but um, it's definitely an option as another collateral source. Uh, lastly, you can look at uh, personal assets such as an automobile. Of course, an automobile with clear title and make sure that you require them to have full coverage insurance and to make sure that your, your IRA is listed as lien holder on that, on that uh, automobile. So you, do, of course, have to go down to the DMV to make sure that um, that pink slip or that title is assigned over to uh, reflects your IRA as the lien holder in the event that uh, something happens to that collateral, you're going to be paid off as the lien holder because that is your uh, another form of security relative to the loan that you're going to be granting. Due diligence. Make sure you check out the condition of the property in the neighborhood. Um, in some of the areas, some properties, it might be a good deal on paper, but it may be in a declining area. So what may uh, start off as a 25 poss a possible 20-25% return, at least based on the numbers that the borrower had project it may turn out to be 5 or 10% because of high vacancy rate or high turnover because you can't keep the tenants in, that, in the property because, say, for example, high crime or whatever the case may be. So um, you definitely add, you want to do some due diligence on the property as the lender to make sure that whatever information that the borrower is providing you to solicit you for borrowed funds really checks out and that you have some kind of a uh, backup or a safety mechanism to make sure that you don't sustain any losses down the road. Screen the borrower, verify credit, income source, assets, and references. If loaning uh, to flippers, verify past performance on previous properties. You want to basically have them show your portfolio. Definitely check the references. Um, if necessary, pull up actual properties, determine when they acquire the property, and kind of look at the time that they acquired the property up until that time that they sold the properties, because you don't want a situation where they're telling you they're going to turn the property in 30 to 60 days, but if you look at all, say, four properties that they give you as a reference to check out, all properties took six months to a year to turn over, and that's fine if uh, you're okay with that, but if you're planning on getting your monies back, say, in 60 to 90 days, and it's turning out to be six to 12 months, you need to know that in advance and find out or at least question as to maybe why did these particular properties take longer than the business model that you're conveying to me. Have title company perform a complete title search for liens and clouds on the title. So as I mentioned earlier, take on the role of the bank. It's going to cost you money to basically have the title company to take uh, to, to perform these additional functions. But remember, if you're buying a house for yourself to live in, when you look at your HUD-1, there's certain closing costs that has to be paid. And usually those closing costs are usually passed on uh, from the bank onto you as the borrower. So you take on the same role as the bank, any incur, uh, cost that you're going to incur to secure your position on that property, you pass that along to the borrower. There's no reason why your profit should be diminished because of fees to protect yourself. That should be part of the loan process or at least the loan charges that you're going to be charging to that borrower. Checklist. Secure a relationship with the title and escrow company because if it's something you're going to be doing on an ongoing basis, you want a good relationship with the title and escrow company, especially if you want them to kind of go over and, and be on the call of duty to make sure that they're protecting your interests beyond just being a client. Secure a relationship with the licensed appraiser because it's important that you, when it comes to appraising the property, you want to make sure that uh, if necessary, if an appraisal is necessary because you don't really you're not comfortable with the MLS listings in terms of what the property value is worth. You want that property appraiser or, uh, to basically serve uh, for you to go out and appraise that property and be as conservative as possible to make sure that you're within your LTV limits or should I say your loan-to-value limits. Uh, secure a relationship with a loan servicer. If long-term, uh, you want to make sure that uh, that loan servicer, usually anything over one year, you want to basically consider going with the loan servicer to make sure that if you have to sell that promissory note uh, shorter than the term of the note, that that loan servicer basically is documenting that those payments have been received on time. They're a reputable third-party source 
to where the person's looking to buy that note from you on the secondary market can count on the information that's being conveyed by that third party cert source that's being reported to credit bureaus that this loan is actually seasoned and truly seasoned. Uh, make sure your appraiser performs the appraisals before uh, using before repair value. So once again, you don't want to uh, get an after repair value. You want to also you want to make sure your loans are based on what the property is worth before any uh, property en enhancements have been made to the property. Have a complete title search performed at the borrower's cost. Once again, that should not be a cost that you should be incurring and not passing on to the borrower. Secure the title insurance at the borrower's cost as well. It's really important that you ensure that you have whatever position that you have listed on that promissory note and that deed of trust. If it's first position, you should be guaranteed that position by doing a title search on that property and getting the insurance to ensure that's where you're going to be uh, on that title. Uh, secure title insurance at the borrower's cost. I see money should be granted only through the title escrow company after the deed of trust has been recorded. So you should have to be in a position to where you're worried about giving monies directly to the borrower and hoping that they do what they're supposed to do with those funds. Those monies should only be dispersed to a reputable title company who's going to ensure that before those funds are dispersed that you have a security interest against that property. Working with other people's money in today's market is more challenging than ever, so one of the things you want to consider when it comes to going to solicit money or even looking for the uh, parties to loan money to is where do you find people uh, who are looking for money? Uh, where do you find people who are lending money? So some of these sources here, uh, business brokers, you want to call some of your local business brokers, kind of let them know who you are and what you're doing, whether you're a borrower or a lender. They can more likely point you in the right direction in terms of um, partnering with someone who maybe have capital to lend or there's a situation where you're looking to borrow funds. Investment ne networking functions is another option. Uh, consultants who work in unique unique industries. You'd be surprised, depending on what someone's expertise is, especially with the turnover in the un, uh, with the un unemployment or the employment situation, they may know someone who just recently was laid off and are looking for some place to invest, whether it be for a business to supplement income or just to grow their retirement account. Investment seminars and workshops. There's always people who are looking to either gain education as well as to network to enhance or grow their business whether they be looking for capital or to loan capital. As I just mentioned, recently terminated or laid off individuals. Uh, in certain areas, especially like, for example, here in Northern California, Silicon Valley, uh, you have a lot of t turnover in the high-tech industry. And, and to couple that or to top it off, just because of the unemployment situation, there's a lot of hefty retirement and or 401k funds that are out there just sitting dormant, where if you come to them with the right proposal and the right business opportunity, they're more than apt to lend those monies or you, let you use those funds as capital for investment. Friends and relatives. Uh, you want to be careful with friends and relatives. You want to definitely make sure that uh, they understand this is a business transaction. You want to perform the necessary due diligence um, on that friend or relative and not be blinded just based on that relationship to make sure that your retirement is protected. Keep in mind, uh, you can make a lot of money using this or any other investment structure, but you can also lose that money. This is your life savings, so make sure you make sure it's professional and you perform the proper due diligence on whoever you decide to work with. Visit your local real estate investment club and meetings. Uh, show up once again. A lot of people are networking there and looking for capital and looking to loan capital. Visit and join on, uh, the online investment forums. Uh, be careful with those because there's a lot of scammers there, at least with some of your local investment clubs you'll kind of get an idea who's coming, or what we consider passerby as opposed to those who've been with the club. Everyone knows that person. They have a reputation. It's easy to get first-hand references on anyone who may be a part of that club or that network to give you that added comfort in terms of what's needed to determine whether you're going to move forward with that individual or not. Publish online classifieds. That's good if you're looking to loan money, but you also want to be careful with that in terms of um, those looking to borrow money. There's a lot of scammers um, in those forums, so you just want to be real careful. How do you ask for money? Be prepared to sell yourself. If you're someone who's looking to borrow money, it's important that you be prepared to sell yourself the investment and as well as the company that you're representing that's going to be, for example, buying and flipping these properties. Make sure that you have a uh, polished uh, professional uh, proposal, giving a brief investment summary of what you're going to be doing, what the funds are going to be used for, 
uh, the term that you're going to be offering, the yield extra strategy, whatever is going to give that lender the peace of mind to move forward, you want to make sure that you provide that to them. Compare your investment opportunity to an existing uh, investment. Uh, for example, if they have money in the stock market and they're not, in most cases, most people are not happy with that. Contrast what the returns would be uh, in terms of what you're offering for an investment yield compared to what they're getting. The number speaks for themselves. Not to mention, um, last time I checked, there was not many investments on Wall Street that were secured. Uh, maybe secured by the principal company, but not by your investment. So you have an opportunity to actually have a secure uh, investment in something tangible in the form of real estate in this case. Emphasize uh, to the lender that uh, the monies that they're going to be loaning to you is going to be uh, collateralized against that subject property. That's always something that's important to, to know and be prepared if they're not uh, up to speed on how, how this process works. You as the borrower also, borrow also need to be educated on this process to maybe help bring them to the table to use a retirement account or to get them over to someone like myself to explain the process to give them the education needed for them to move forward if necessary on that investment. Demonstrate that you are the expert in your area. Be, as, once again, as transparent as possible, offering references, credentials, and whatever is necessary to show them that you're an expert in the field. Make sure you offer a competitive yield. There's nothing worse than basically lowballing someone where, say, they're earning 1% to 3% in the market. Uh, you offer them 5%, but everyone else is offering 8 to 10%. They will more likely go for it because they don't know any better, but if they find out later through friends, relative, or just kind of basically venturing out into the market, they could have got 8 to 10%. I can guarantee you when that transaction is concluded that you more likely will not get that business again because they felt taken advantage of. I think the best way of basically developing the ability or raising capital is to take care of your, bar, of your uh, lenders to where they're not only going to continue to come to you to lend you money, but they also are going to refer other parties with retirement accounts or other capital to you as well. So if you conduct yourself in a professional manner, usually within the first year, you'll experience that you, after that first year of you doing everything right, that you have more than enough money that you may need for some of these projects. So just always be transparent and professional in terms of how you conduct yourself if you're the borrower. My name is Lamar Baxter once again. I am the Director of Business Development for Acne Plan Benefit Services. I hope you got a lot out of this information. hope that what I share with you will at least open your eyes in terms of how self-directed IRA works, in particular using your self-directed retirement account for private lending. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are interested in this subject, but not a lot of information. So my objective, once again, is to educate the public in terms of what's out there and to hopefully put them in a secure position to, to grow their retirement account. I'd like to thank you once again. If you have any questions, my contact information is here. Feel free to email me or give me a call. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I'd like to thank, thank you again and have a great day.